morning. Let's go ahead and find our seat. All right. Look, that's why you come to church on Sunday. That's why. You don't, you don't get that at home. And I'm not talking about like the experience. I'm talking about what we were doing. We were offering, we were collectively as a church body, offering up worship and praise to God. You can't do that at home. You can, but God desires personal worship, but also corporate worship as well. And as the corporate body of believers comes together and offers God God, his, his, his worth and his praise, something happens in you as you worship him. So I encourage you, come to church on Sunday for that very reason. We come to worship the living God. That's why we're here. Amen? All right. If you're here, if you're new, my name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors. Welcome. Let's get into the word. Luke 18. Luke 18. Last week, Pastor Matt started a discussion on emotions and how they're related to our humanity. And simply put, to be human is to have emotions. God made us with feelings. He made us with emotions. And when you suppress those feelings and you disregard those emotions and you try to live an emotionless existence, you are pursuing a subhuman experience. You're not a reptile. You're not a robot. Robots have no emotions. Humans do. And when you live as if you don't have emotion and you try to suppress those emotions, you're actually not going to live to the fullness of what God intended you to live. And so this week, I want to take a, a second, I want to take a second week to sort of unpack emotions because I believe emotions are so central to our humanity and so central to our relationship with God that the suppression and misapplication of emotions will lead to spiritual decline or spiritual stagnation. It's that central. I'll say it again. Emotions are so central to our humanity and so central to our faith that to misinterpret emotions or to misunderstand emotion or to suppress emotion will actually prevent your spiritual growth and can even lead you towards spiritual decline. We're going to see that today. So before we jump into the scripture, I want to frame emotions and feelings. Re revisit last week a little bit. Emotions and feelings are similar, and yet they're a little bit different. Emotions are responses. They're moods that you experience in response to things. There's six universal emotions that all humans experience. Whether you're in America or the other side of the world, all humans have six emotions that they'll experience. Disgust, sadness, anger, Discuss sadness, anger, fear, happiness, and surprise. Those six things, I'll say them again. Fear, disgust, anger, sadness, happiness, surprise. Those are the six moods or responses that your body and mind will experience. Feelings are similar but different. Feelings are the meanings that you attach to those emotions. Feelings bring frame to the emotion. They're, they're what you interpret that emotion to be. So for example, let's say I'm sad. I'm experiencing sadness because my partner left. And so as I'm experiencing sadness, I feel lonely. You see that? Or, or I stole from you and I see you crying. I experience sadness and I'm feeling shame. Sadness is the emotion, shame or loneliness is the feeling. It's bringing frame, it's bringing interpretation to that, that emotion I'm experiencing. Does that make sense? Now, very easy to sit back and say, this is secular psychology, this has nothing to do with the Bible or nothing to do with your soul. I'm telling you, in my opinion, this is 100% tied to your soul and it's 100% tied to your faith. And if you fail to realize that, you're actually going to prevent your spiritual growth. Don't take my word for it. Let's, let's see what the Word of God has to say. Luke chapter 18. It reads, a certain ruler asked him, talking about Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. 
No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. All right, so let's unpack this interaction. Jesus is having an interaction with a, with a rich young ruler. This young man comes to Jesus with a, a question about eternal life. He wants to know, what must I do in order to get to heaven? And I can appreciate this man's posture because it shows that his, his mindset isn't just on the here and now. He's, he's considering eternally, eternally. He's, he's aware of his mortality. And so often riches can lead us to only consider and only focus the, the here and now. And our comforts and our power, they'll influence us to overlook the greater matters of eternity. And so the fact that the rich young man is considering eternity shows he has some, some real promise to him. But the young man is off in his understanding. He thinks eternal life is something found in him. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How can I earn eternal life? My efforts, my abilities will somehow give me eternal life. And Jesus lovingly meets him where he's at. He gives him a list of commandments to do. And though this may not be obvious on the surface, what Jesus is doing, he's roping this young man in. He's bringing him into a, a deeper conversation. He gives him a list, five do's and don'ts. And the man says, cool, I can do that. In fact, I've done that since I was a little boy. And then I imagine Jesus looking at him and, and smiling. Jesus gives him one more command. And he gives him a command he knows it would be a little bit more hard for him to do. He says, one thing you lack, go home, give away everything you have, and then come follow me. And then in the story, we see some emotion start to enter in. Go back to verse 23, if you don't mind. When he heard this, he became very what? Very sad because he was wealthy. The man was very sad at this commandment. Now think about this, why was he sad? Jesus had already given him five other commandments. He said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother, don't steal. And none of those commandments led him to be sad. But this final commandment causes this young man to experience deep sadness. And why? Well, the Bible tells us because he was very wealthy. You see, the thought of giving up all his money made him sad because his money was central to his heart. He loved his money. He loved his wealth, and he didn't want to part ways with it. And this highlights the centrality of emotions when it comes to humanity. This, this brings to light how intricate emotions are to your soul. Write this down. Emotions and feelings reveal your heart. Write that down. Really grab onto that. Your emotions and your feelings, they reveal your heart. Hmm. The sadness that he experienced wasn't an automated response. Again, Jesus said, hey, don't commit murder, and he didn't feel sadness about that. He said, don't commit adultery, and he didn't feel sadness about that. But the thought of giving away his money produced sadness because money was central to his heart. Money was more valuable than Jesus. And what Jesus has done, he has intentionally unearthed an idol in this man's heart, and the emotion revealed it. Your emotions are a window into your heart. Never build a doctrine off of one example in Scripture. So I'll give you another one. Write down John chapter 2, verses 13 and 17. John 2, 13 and 17. 
It says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins and the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. All right, so let's get some context. It's the Passover festival. And so this was a, a yearly thing where Jews from all over the world had to come back to Jerusalem to celebrate this holiday or celebrate this, this festival. So no matter where you were, you needed to come back to Jerusalem for this, which means that the population in Jerusalem was sort of swell for this, for this week or two. And so Jesus goes into the temple, and he goes berserk. He forms a, a whip out of some cords and starts chasing people out of the temple. Okay, let that soak in. Jesus, the one you see in the children's books with the, the gentle beard and the blue sash, that Jesus is running around the temple whipping people, literally forms a small uh, stampede of, of cattle and a small stampede of farm animals. And they're running around the temple and he's driving them out and he's driving people out and he's knocking money off of the tables and he's overturning tables. He's going nuts. Why? It's clearly angry, clear emotion. Why is he so angry? Look back to verse 16. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. So he's angry because they turned his father's house into a market. So when all the Jews would come back to Jerusalem, everyone had to go to the temple and offer animal sacrifices. And so what the religious leaders decided was that in their, for their convenience, let's set up a market at the temple, in the temple, so that people can come and purchase their animals right here, right now, for their sacrifices. And so what's going on here is that these religious leaders saw this as an occasion, as a religious occasion to make a little money. They saw the worship of God as an opportunity for their own personal benefit. They corrupted the worship, and Jesus goes livid because they're messing with the house of God. He don't like that. They've polluted, they've corrupted, they've put their greedy fingers on God's worship, and Jesus ain't having it. His anger reveals his heart. He's passionate about the house of God. He's zealous about worship. He's not going to stand around and let folks pollute and corrupt worship. His anger revealed what was central to his heart. Listen, your emotions are the window into your soul. If you want to know what's inside of you, you need to look no further than your emotions. Your heart, what you truly desire, what's most important to you, what's central to your affections, who you really are, what you really value, that will be revealed by your emotions. And you consider the Super Bowl. Two people... Two groups of people are going to observe the exact same thing and have exact opposite responses. Millions of people are going to watch the exact same thing but feel different. No matter how the game goes, one group's going to feel ecstasy and elation, and another group is going to feel sorrow and remorse. They watch the exact same thing. They felt opposite ways. Why? Their heart. Those who feel happiness at the end of the game means that their team, that they wanted to win, won. Those who are sad means that their desire was for the other team to win. And those who are indifferent means that they didn't have a strong desire about who won. But don't miss this. All three groups, the emotion revealed what was in their heart. What causes you joy? What causes you sorrow? What causes you anger and frustration? Whatever that is, that's a window into your soul, believe it or not. It says something about, about your heart. When you consider the things of God, what sort of emotions and feelings do you feel? Do you feel joy? 
Do you feel excitement? Do you feel boredom? Do you feel apathy? Those emotions, those feelings are a window into your affections for God. Your emotions don't lie. Well, they can deceive you, but they don't lie. They say what's going on inside of you. Start paying attention to your emotions. They're a window to your heart, and if understood properly, they can lead towards spiritual transformation. But if misunderstood and misinterpreted and misapplied, your emotions can lead you towards spiritual decline. Let me show you a very clear example of that. Write down 1 Samuel chapter 18, Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 18, and go to verse 6. I'm sorry, my microphone's having some issues, so I'm... All right, 1 Samuel 18, 6. It says, when the men returned home, after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with trembles and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. All right, so David and Saul return home from defeating Goliath, and David is greatly adored by Israel. If you're not familiar with the story, Goliath is a giant. He's evil. He taunts the armies of God and disrespects God for 40 days and 40 nights. And every man in Israel, everyone in the army, including Saul, had an opportunity to go out and fight him, and no one did. And so David comes out, and by God's grace, he slays the giant, and when he returns home, he's a hero. They have a parade for him. They're singing him. They're, they're praising his name, not worshiping, but just, just giving him credit. And then Saul starts to experience some intense emotion. He's angry. He's experiencing frustration. And from that day forward, he keeps a close eye on David. He stops trusting David and starts despising David. He starts hating David. He starts seeking an opportunity to kill David. For the next six chapters of Samuel, it's all about Saul trying his best, doing everything in his power to kill David, a man who actually loves Saul. And you don't think emotions are connected to your soul. And you don't think emotions have any implications or bearing on spiritual things. You thought wrong. I want to show you deeper layers of what's going on in Saul's heart. Okay, let's, let's go to 1 Samuel 22, verse 6. We're going to get a a deeper window into what's going on inside Saul. 1 Samuel 22. Verse 6, it says, Now Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered. And Saul was seated spear in hand under the tamarisk tree on the hill of Gibeah, with all his officials standing at his side. He said to them, Listen, men of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse, talking about David, Give all you fields and vineyards? Will he make all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Is that why you have all conspired against me? No one tells me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son has incited my servant to lie and wait for me as he does today. Pause there. Look at what Saul's emotions have led him to. Saul believes that his army is conspiring against him. It says it right there. Saul believes that his army doesn't care about him. It says it right there. Saul believes that his army is helping David try to kill him. 
his misapplication of his emotions is driving him into spiritual decline. He's not interpreting and applying his emotions properly, and it's going to hurt him. Let's look at another example. Skip ahead a few verses to verse 11 now. 2 Samuel 22, verse 11. Then the king, talking about Saul, sent for the priest of Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, and all the men of his family, who were the priests at Nob, and they all came to the king. Saul said, listen now. Yes, my lord, they answered. Saul said to him, why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and inquiring of God for him, so that he has rebelled against me and lies in wait for me as he does today? Pause. Here's more of what Saul believes. Saul believes that the priests, the religious leaders, the priests of Nob are conspiring against him and that the priests of Nob are helping David try to kill him. Question, is any of this true? No, not an ounce of it is true. And yet Saul is fully convinced, fully convinced based off his emotion that all these things are accurate. They're not plotting to kill him. They're not scheming against him. But he believes that it's true. So listen, this is so vital. Please don't miss this point. Just consider it. If you take this point and you believe it, I, in my opinion, I think it, it, it can transform a lot of hurting relationships. Okay. Saul has taken an emotion and built a false narrative from it. That's what's going on. Saul has taken an emotion inside of him and caused that or used that to create a false story about them. Saul, instead of taking the emotion and focusing on himself, he turned outward and said, I feel this because you are this way. And here's the next point. It won't be on the screen but it's vital for us to understand regarding emotions. Write this down. It won't be on the screen. Emotions reveal what's going on inside of you, not inside of others. Oh, that is so vital. Write it down and consider it. Our emotions reveal what's going on inside of us, not inside of other people. Saul experienced anger. Anger was inside of him. He felt that. It was real. But instead of focusing on himself, he turned outward and began to make judgments and assumptions and form opinions about others. And when you experience emotion and you experience feeling and you become more concerned about what that means about someone else instead of what it means inside of you, you will begin to ruin your relationships and wreck your life just like Saul did. Your emotions are a window into your heart, not someone else's heart. And when you misapply that, you're going to start doing damage to yourself. Do we do this? Oh, we do this all of the time. Taking stuff inside of us and thinking it means this about you. I'll give you a few practical examples. A man is waiting for his wife to come home. They're hoping, he's hoping they have a, a nice intimate, romantic evening. So he gets the couch ready. He gets the ice cream ready. Turns on college football, right? A romantic, <laughs> romantic evening. So the wife comes home, greets him, but then she goes straight to the room where the kids are. He says, oh, that's kind of weird, but, you know, maybe, maybe she just wants to kiss them in bed, you know, kiss them goodnight. I haven't seen, she hasn't seen them all day. Ten minutes later, he walks by the, the room and peeks in, and she's in there with the kids playing a board game, laughing, having fun, and emotion begins to flood him. He feels sad. He feels rejected, and he takes that feeling, and he determines she loves the kids more than me. This feeling inside of me means that she loves the kids more than me. If she loved me, she'd be on the couch with me. If she loved me, she'd be watching college football, eating ice cream. 
But this feeling inside of me means this about her. Let's go to the next, the next house, the, the, the neighbor next door. It's a woman waiting for her husband to come home. She's prepared a nice dinner for him. She's hoping to have a nice, romantic, intimate evening as well. She got her, her high heels on. She put on her dress she just got from Nordstrom, right? Did her hair, did her nails, made a nice dinner, awaiting the arrival of her man. So her man comes home, but the interaction isn't what she expected. He walks in the house, but he has a, a half-eaten burrito, right? He must have stopped on the way home for food. But that's okay. There's, there's still dessert. And so she brings out the dessert. She lays out some cookies before him. But the husband says, oh, honey, I'm sorry. I, I can't eat those. Someone brought cookies into the office today, and I, I had so many, I can't, I can't possibly eat another one. So she's a little frustrated by that. She says, okay, well, who brought cookies in? He says, Riley. Oh, Riley brought cookies in. Okay. So the husband excuses himself, goes to the restroom, and his phone beeps. So the wife takes the phone and looks. She reads his text message, and the text message says something like this. Today was an amazing day. So happy to be working with you. Can't wait for tomorrow. Signed, Riley. Hmm. An emotion begins to flood her body. She feels fear. She feels anger. She, she feels forgotten. She feels disrespected. She feels threatened. And with those feelings, she decides he likes her. He's more interested in Riley. Hmm. These feelings in me means that he might be interested in her. He doesn't care about me. He's uncaring. He's unloving. Because this feeling in me means something about him. I'll give you one more example. Very common. A young man, mid-30s, single, walks into church. He's a little late, sits towards the back. The person gives announcements, and the person announces, young married night coming up soon. Get your tickets. The next announcement is that we need more volunteers for the children's ministry. Then the pastor comes up, the pastor gives a sermon, he talks about married people and uses a marriage illustration. And the young single man begins to feel emotion. He's anxious. He's uncomfortable. He starts to feel nervous. He takes that feeling inside of him. He determines this church only cares about married people. This church is not for me. I feel unseen. I feel uncared for because this feeling in me means the pastor only cares about married people. Now, in all three of these scenarios, the person took something in them and made it about someone else. None of these scenarios, none of these examples had anything to do with them. The emotion you experienced was your emotion but you formed a false narrative from it, believed it, and started acting according to it. We do this all the time. If I'm feeling this, this means this about you. If I'm feeling this, that means you don't whatever. We do this with God as well. I didn't get the job. I was so sad. I'm hurt. I feel rejected. That must mean God doesn't love me. That must mean God's not trustworthy. That must mean God's not real. And all of this is connected to our misunderstanding of our emotions, our misunderstanding of our feelings. And listen, I believe Satan is behind all of it, all of it. We had a series a few months ago called The Unseen World. The premise of it was that there's a dimension to life that you can't see with your natural eyes, but it's real nonetheless, and it has real bearing and real impact on your life. We didn't talk too much about this, but it's important to know Satan is real, and his primary scheme, or one of his primary schemes to wreck your life is to work through lies and deception. Lies and deception are the bread and butter of the enemy. 
He can wreck your life if he can get you to believe and live according to lies. All right, so when you talk about spiritual warfare, lies are central to that. And when you're in pain of any sort, you're in a vulnerable state. When you're in pain, physical pain or especially emotional pain, you tend to look for an answer. You tend to look for anything that can help explain or help ease the pain. And when you're in that vulnerable state, that's the prime spot for Satan to come in and get you to believe and live according to lies and set you on the course of destruction. Oh, you're hurt. Your feelings are hurt. You feel unloved. You feel rejected. Well, that's because they don't love you. If they loved you, they wouldn't do that. Or you feel uncared for. That's because they don't care about you. If they cared you, they wouldn't do that. And they'll take it a step further if you let them. And they don't love you because you're not lovable. They reject you because you're unworthy. And now what he's done, he's seized the opportunity afforded by the pain of emotional pain. And he's got you to believe lies about other people and lies about yourself when the reality is that emotion was something for you to look inward about and bring transformation to yourself. That's how the enemy works. And rather than, like I said, rather than you feeling that feeling and letting it lead you to a deeper understanding of your heart, you have now formed false narratives about others, false narratives about yourself, and you're going to live according to these wrongful assumptions and ruin your life and ruin the lives of others. And you don't think emotions are tied to spiritual things. For years, years, I thought emotions were whatever, secular, not true. I was dead wrong. In the past eight months, I have experienced more, I think, transformation in eight months than I ever have. And it's been directly correlated to my understanding or my awareness of emotions. I want to show you something interesting regarding Saul's situation. Okay, let's, let's go back to 1 Samuel 18, verse 6. I'm going to read it again. It says, When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out of all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul, was singing and dancing with joyful songs. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Here's the emotion. Saul was very angry, and this refrain, refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? From that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Okay. We see the emotion. We, we see the anger. He's frustrated. The, the, the anger's there, but look at what happens next. Look at verse 10. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. Okay, so don't miss that. Saul's decline and paranoia and false narratives that led to his destruction was preceded by an evil spirit. So is it possible, this is just conjecture, this is just speculation, is it possible that Saul experienced anger, experienced emotion, and Satan seized the opportunity and got him to believe lies and form false narratives that led him to his destruction and the destruction of others? Is it possible? You can be the judge. But what I think we need to understand is that our emotions mean something about us, not something about them. Emotions are a window into your heart, not a window into someone else's heart. And if you get that backwards and start making wrong judgments and wrong assumptions about other people, you will wreck your life just like Saul. Emotions are the window into your heart. Emotions reveal what's going on inside of you, not inside of others. And I'll give you one more as we prepare to close. It won't be on the screen, but it's worth writing down. Your emotions, listen, your emotions are your responsibility. Write that down. Your emotions are your responsibility. This is going to hurt some feelings right now, but just stay with me. Your emotions are your responsibility. Write down Mark chapter 10. 
Verse 17. Mark 10, 17 to 22. Is that on the screen? Okay, it won't be on the screen. Again, sometimes the inspiration comes late, so everything doesn't get on the screen. Okay, I'll read it for you. It's the same story, but from a different perspective. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. The reason why I want to show you this, this perspective is because it gives us a little bit more insight. The man wasn't just sad. The man went away sad. He left Jesus' presence. He, he departed from Jesus in this sad state. I imagine him walking by, walking away, shoulders over, looking back a few times, like, you know, like a little kid does. You're sad, and you look back to see if they're looking or not, right? He's doing that. And what does Jesus do? So you might know, can, can you read it in your, what does Jesus do? He leaves him. He says, go ahead, go. He lets him be sad. He doesn't chase him down. Wait, I'm sorry. Wait, come back. Wait, I don't want you to feel that way. Wait, let, let, me, let me change the standard. He, he lets him be sad. Why? It's a lot there. I believe because Jesus understands that man's emotions are his responsibility. They're not my responsibility. We're going to get into this more next week because there's a lot of, there's a lot there. And we are not called to be people who trample on other people's feelings. So you, you you can misunderstand this a lot of ways, so we're going to spend some time unpacking this. But if you look in Scripture, which we'll do next week, I believe God calls us to be accountable for our emotions not accountable for the emotions of other people. God expects us to manage our stuff. So, as we prepare to close, a couple questions for reflection, things to consider in your quiet time. If emotions are the window to your heart, how aware of you are you of your emotions? Self-awareness is vital to the Christian life, vital to your spiritual growth. And if you're unaware of what's going on inside of you, you're likely unaware of what your heart really loves and what's, what's your soul, the state of your, your soul. So what causes you great joy? What causes you great sadness and sorrow? Pray that God would reveal that to you and then ask God to give you, ask God to peel back the layers behind it, whether it's good or bad. Because as you peel back those layers, you're going to start to understand more of what's in your heart and, and in what's in your soul. How aware are you of your emotions? Uh, second question, are you interpreting your emotions accurately? Are you possibly being misled by your emotions? Really consider that. Is it possible? Think about Saul for a moment. Saul saw God move in visible form probably more than any of us ever have. I mean, there's some real incredible things that Saul was exposed to. And yet he was susceptible to forming a false narrative based on his emotions. Is it possible that the judgment that I'm making about you might not be accurate? Is it possible? Go back to the Riley example for a moment. He's having an affair because I feel that. But what happens when you find out that Riley's a guy? (laughs) Riley could be a guy. Men can bake cookies. Right? Well, when you find out Riley's a guy, now how do you feel? That emotion, well, may, maybe you feel, I got an even bigger problem, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but typically, typically, oh, it's a guy? Oh, I don't feel threatened anymore. What's the point? 
Your emotions are real, but they don't necessarily mean that about them. We have to have the humility to understand that. And the reason I'm so passionate about this, I lived like this for years. This in me means this about you. And I was wrong. I was wrong. And so if we can consider this, it will bring us toward spiritual maturity, emotional maturity, and, and, and greater health. Final question, are you taking responsibility for your emotions or are you expecting others to manage your emotions for you? Second question you can ask, are you managing other people's emotions for them? People pleasers. Are you managing other people's emotions for them or are you letting them do what God has actually called them to do? Reflect on these things this week. And the hope is that God, through our understanding of emotions, will lead, lead us to deeper levels of transformation so that we might reflect him more, give him more glory, and live in the fullness of our humanity. Amen? You got some, uh, we have some work to do this week. Let's get after it. Let's pray. Lord, we want to grow. We, I, don't want to be stagnant. I don't want, we don't want to be content with where we're at. We want to grow into the image of Christ, all that you might be glorified through that. And I believe our emotions are a part of that. Would you please help us become more aware of what we're feeling, more aware of what we're feeling, and more able and willing to surrender that to you. Our emotions are real, our feelings are real, but they can mislead us. Help us to interpret them properly. Help us to respond to them properly. Help us to apply them properly, all that we might grow. Lord, please give us grace this week to to do that deep soul work, to re really evaluate what's going on inside of us, and to learn what's really in our heart. Please peel back these layers and help us to understand more of ourselves. Again, all that we might grow into who you made us to be. We want to be fully human. We want to live in the fullness of our humanity. Please help us identify our emotions and press toward that. Give us the grace, God. So in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said together. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and close and give God some praise. Sing praise God. Praise God from whom If you're new, stop by the Welcome Center. We'd love to get your information. We have a gift for you. We'd love to stay connected. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team will be up here. They'd love to pray with you, encourage you. If you are new to faith, if you don't understand all of this, let them pray with you. Come talk to myself. Come talk to Pastor Matt. But that feeling inside, again, it's a window into your heart. God is stirring something. He's doing something in you. Don't just ignore that. Come investigate that and, and let us help you with that. God bless you. Keep coming to church. That's vital. Bring a friend, and let's continue to grow together. Amen? All right. God bless you. See you next week.